Mark Berman of the New York Post with Armin and Levac, 104.5, the team. He covered every game of the NBA Finals and was there. And Mark, as Steve Kerr lifted the Larry O'Brien trophy earlier this week, what was going through the mind of Phil Jackson? Yeah, well, I think he preferred Kerr uh, winning the championship uh, over Shumpert and J.R. Smith. I don't think (laughs) Phil wanted to see those guys celebrating in the locker room with champagne. But it still had to be very bittersweet for Phil. He was the first to identify Steve, you know, as a as a as a great head coach, as a potentially great head coach, and he just couldn't close the deal in time uh, before Golden State got in the mix. The biggest irony is if Golden State, if Mark Jackson could get Golden State into the second round last uh, May, uh, then Kerr probably finalizes the Knicks deal. So. Just an an amazing turn of events. Now, as a Knicks fan, as as we watch Kerr lift the trophy, do we sit here and look at Fisher and go, that was a bad consolation prize, or or do we still have confidence in him? I don't have that much confidence in Derek Fisher. He didn't show me anything in his first year. He's pretty good with the press, with his rhetoric. But, um, you know, before he started the job, I had done a story someone from the Oklahoma City organization, saying that he was great as a motivational speaker, as a player, but he's all rah-rah. And to hear him make long speeches as a coach three times a day might wear out the players. Uh, I think they played hard. Uh, I just wasn't quite sure that uh, strategically he knew what he was doing in the final minutes of games. I think his uh, rotations constantly changed, constantly changed the starting lineup. But listen, he's a rookie. He was thrown into the fire. I think he'll be better next year. But I think Steve Kerr is a dynamo. And as a rookie, he seemed like he was a veteran already because of his years as a GM and as a TNT broadcaster, being close to the game, uh, you know, meeting with coaches before the games and stuff. So he was just so much better prepared than Derek. Mark Berman of the New York Post. And, and Mark, you were around Steve Kerr for the entire final series. Do you get the vibe that he has the potential to be one of the better or one of the greatest coaches in the NBA by the time his career is done? I mean, are we to that point yet? Yeah, I do. I think that he's taken all the best parts of Phil and Popovich and Lute Olsen uh, and even Mike D'Antoni, who served as his coach when he was with Phoenix as the general manager, and he's he's his own person. He has his own sarcastic personality. I mean, just speaking to David Lee before the finals, and David Lee had his role completely obliterated. And for Dave to say that, you know, most of his friends think that he would hate Steve, but he says that Steve did such a great job at explaining things to him and keeping communication lines open. That's the biggest part of being a head coach in the NBA sometimes is the communication with the players and keeping everyone happy. He kept everyone happy in Golden State. He did a terrific job. He's got a great personality uh, for the job. All right, so Phil whiffs on Steve Kerr. What are we grading him on his trade of J.R. Smith and Amon Shumpert now that we've seen how they performed in the finals? Well, I mean, they were playing against a great team, and, and the Warriors' defense is very underrated. Shumpert was definitely hurt, uh, you know, he had he was playing, I thought, with one arm. He wasn't the same hell-bent defender, and he was very uh, passive offensively. I think he had his groin thing going and his shoulder. But he had an excellent playoffs uh, going into the finals. Smith lost his shot, you know, for most of the games. Uh, but that's JR, and that's the problem with depending on him too much. I don't think that the Cavaliers next season will depend on him as much, but he was thrust into that role because of the injuries to Love and Kyrie. But, you know, I thought, you know, they they made commendable contributions, and what the Knicks got back in return was, frankly, nothing, including cap space. I was writing this at the time. J.R. had his opt-out, and Phil talked about how they saved cap space. J.R. may have opted out. He says he's going to opt out now, 
And I think if he had a good final two, three months to the season with the Knicks, he would have opted out also. He was the one that wanted the opt-out clause. Right. Uh, so I don't know what the Knicks got out of it. Mark Berman of the New York Post with Armin and Levac. Mark, with J.R. Smith not playing well as the number two option in Cleveland, did that legitimize, legitimize the Knicks a little bit for the fact that J.R. Smith never came around in New York when they tried to make that happen as well? Yeah, I don't think you could win a championship if he is, again, the second, third guy. He's just too inconsistent. He's been that way his whole career. That's why Denver and Carmelo never went too far in the playoffs most of those years. Uh, but I think he's still you know, a good guy off the bench who could play 15 to 20 minutes a night on a very good team. But the Cavaliers thrust him into a gigantic role. But I still think he's a good player. At $6 million a year, he's, he's pretty good. That's a pretty good salary right now, uh, a pretty good value. But, yeah, for sure. I mean, he's... He's not what LeBron thought he might be, and I think LeBron was very disappointed in him and Shumpert as well. So do you think the Cavs will make a run at, at bringing J.R. Smith back if he opts out? Uh, depending on what J.R. asked for. You know, when, when J.R. was a free agent last, a couple of years ago, he couldn't get any big offers, and that was coming off the sixth man of the year. So... Uh, yeah, I think they're going to try to bring him back. You know, I, I have a feeling that LeBron was very frustrated, but when he sees the big picture that when those two guys came aboard, things changed. But I think uh, in the future, LeBron hopes in the finals, Jr. won't be playing 30-plus 30 mi- 30 minutes a night. That's fair. You just see images of him, you know, falling asleep behind David Blatt at halftime with the camera that they had in the locker room. You see J.R. Smith taking dumb shots, and you just wonder if LeBron wants to take this guy aside and just smack the living crap out of him, you know? Yeah, well, LeBron has known him for a long, long time, uh, dating to their late high school days. And early on in J.R.'s career, he would uh, go spend a week in Akron and work out with LeBron and a few people. So LeBron, who is close friends with Carmelo, he knows the ups and downs with Jr. But he thought he was catching lightning in a bottle and was hoping that Jr.'s torrid stretch would continue. But he, he not only did he shoot the ball poorly, but in that victory, he almost cost them for three terrible fouls he committed uh, late in the game. Uh, and defensively, defensively, he was definitely. Uh, not as good as he was in the regular season with Cleveland. So, yeah, it was a little bit of an eye-opener, but I think LeBron knew what J.R. is, and he was just hoping that he could get another week and a half out of him. Mark Berman of the New York Post. He knows everything Knicks at NYPost underscore Berman on Twitter. Mark, what do you what do you think the Knicks will do with the fourth overall pick in this year's draft? Yeah, it, it really does look like the, their three – Top guys, uh, Okafor, Towns, and Russell won't be there. And then it comes down to uh, Moutier, the point guard, who I just don't think they feel comfortable enough with going with the fourth pick. I think he didn't play enough in China. Uh, He's not a good enough shooter, I think, for the triangle. I think Phil may go with Justin Winslow for his defensive prowess, great leader, winner, or... The big man, Willie uh, Colley-Stein, had a terrific workout a couple of days ago. If he stays at four, I think those are the two guys. If he trades down, uh, you know, you got Kaminsky and uh, Trey Lyles from Kentucky, who I know I was on a conference call with Calipari. Phil came out of one of the Kentucky practices and said that Lyles was, would be a good fit for a triangle. But, you know, he's a stretch at four. But I would like to see them uh, take Winslow or uh, Willie Colley Stein. They they need a big man. They need a defender. They and and he's a new age defender, a guy who could guard five positions. He's definitely raw offensively, and that's a big concern. Mark the odds that the Knicks trade back and trade out of the fourth spot. Yeah, I think they're trying to see something. They're trying. <laughs> I mean, they they would like to. I think. Because they fell to number four, uh, you know, and if it was Okafor, Towns, or Russell, I think they'd stay put. But once they got into the fourth spot, 
They have these trade exceptions, a bunch of them that expire that night, uh, where they could take in a veteran player making anywhere between two or six million dollars uh, to make a trade very easy to do. And if they could get into you know ten, eleven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, where a Kaminsky is still there, or, or a Lyles, or a Payne, that point guard from Murray State, if they could get two assets out of it. I think they'd be pretty happy. The question is, who's going to just give up a, a solid veteran on a long, you know, it would cut into their cap space. So it's got to be a guy, a veteran player that they really, really like and really fits into the triangle. Mark Berman of the New York Post. He has your NBA draft covered all, all of next week. Check him out on Twitter as well, at NYPost underscore Berman. Mark, have really enjoyed your tweets and your updates from the NBA Finals and always appreciate your insight on the Knicks, my friend. Oh, tremendous. Thanks again for having me on.